Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education interview series. It's Tuesday, January 26, 2010, and our guests today are Michael Horn, Catherine Mackey, and James Sloan to talk about the latest InnoSight Institute study, Voice Academy, pioneering a blended learning model in a Chicago public high school. We're sure glad that you're here with us today. Uh, these events are sponsored by Learn Central. Learn Central is a free educational network, a social network for educators uh, that I have some responsibility for. Hope you'll join us at learncentral.org where you can connect with other educators and even hold free live events like this. Coming up on conversations.net and futureofeducation.com tomorrow, Dan Coyle on the talent code. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, not on that list, and actually tonight is the, uh, at 5 o'clock. Pacific 8 Eastern is a special PBS show on STEM education using some kids programming. Sorry, I didn't have that in there. Um, but that's on my blog at stevehargadon.com if you're interested. That's tonight in just a few hours. Uh, this weekend, the Educon conference will be broadcasting live all of the sessions from that conference. Uh, and I'll post a schedule on my blog post on uh, my blog as well. February 2nd, Tara Hunt on the Wifi Factor. February 3rd, James Paul G. Uh, February 4th, Shell Israel. February 9th, Lisa Gillis on online high schools. February 10th, Larry Johnson. February 11th, Clay Shirky, all clapping. February 16th, David Simon Garland, Dan Pink, then Scott Rosenberg, Sharon Peters, Tony Wagner, and much more. Still waiting for Ken Robinson to reschedule. Boy, I really feel like uh, I really feel excited when that happens. Okay, but lots more fun stuff ahead. Now, if this is your first time at Illuminate, want to make sure you understand this is a participative environment, so there are tools here for you to participate during the session. Uh, the foremost of which is the uh, chat window, and I'm going to give you a little, um, well, there we go. My little hand can go and show you where that is, but this is the participant window where you see the other participants, and then down here roughly is the chat window and you can put messages in that chat window, and that's a good place to ask questions. Uh, if you think you'd like to ask a question using the microphone later in the show, do go up to Tools Audio and run the Audio Setup Wizard to make sure your microphone is working. Uh, to do that, you raise your hand. You'll see a little uh, icon with a hand and a green up arrow, and that says that you're interested in taking the mic. And typically, we wait toward the end of the show to do that. To the right of that hand icon with the green up arrow, you'll see a smiley face, a clapping hand, thumbs down and frowny face. Those are ways of expressing your response or reaction to things that are said. And then to the right is the whiteboard, and I'm going to give you permissions to modify that whiteboard right now and to let us know where you're listening from. So look for the little wand with the red star at the end to the left of the map. Click on that and then click on the map and let us know where you're listening from. So I haven't seen Spain come up yet, but I know you're there, Ray. Look like someone in the UK, Canada, Mexico. This must be a good time for uh, West Coasters. This is earlier than we normally do it. <laughs> Fun. So James, you can't see the full list, but we have 43 people in the room, for mostly in the United States. Um, one in Canada, one in Mexico, one in England, and I know there's one in Spain. So. We're sure glad to have everybody here. OK, so uh, what we've done in the past, this is actually, I think, our, is this, Michael, is this our fourth session together? Uh, I believe it's our third, right? Or four, no, our fourth, yes. That's right. Because we, we originally did we the originally disrupting, did class. disrupting class. That's a great point. And then we've done, um, we did your uh, Alpine study. And the Florida Virtual Schools, and now here Chicago, the Chicago Public School. So this is really a lot of fun. I'm going to turn it over to you and Catherine, and uh, and let you uh, move forward. Let me know how I can help. I will try and track questions, and um, call on me if you need anything. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Steve, uh, for this opportunity. Again, we uh, just love to participate in these, and it's a good opportunity for us to sort of sit back and, and talk about the case studies we've just done. Hear a lot of uh, feedback from people uh, about what they think and so forth, and uh, want to thank Learn Central as well for helping make this possible, of course, and illuminate 
uh, and I also see that in, in the audience, if I'm not mistaken, actually at least one person uh, from Boys is here as well. Uh, they seem to be uh, represented, so we're excited that they're on the uh, they're in the session and can jump in and correct us if we make any mistakes or anything like that along the way. Uh, this case study was a really interesting one for us because uh, when we when we wrote the book and, and thought a lot about uh, online learning, uh, we hypothesized that it would improve over time uh, along a lot of uh, dimensions, from content to uh, richer sessions through Illuminate and, and tools like it that allow for better interaction with people, uh, as well as increasingly becoming less of a distance phenomenon and moving into the uh, into a hybrid format uh, with bricks and mortar. And we've seen a lot of that with this case, and uh, which is exciting for us. And so James Sloan was the primary author in this case study along with Catherine Mackey. And James, you got to spend uh, several days uh, at, at the Boys Academy. Can you just sort of uh, step back and tell us broadly, uh, you know, what is the Boys Academy and, and what is it like when you, uh, when, when you walk in there? What, how does it work? Yeah, sure, happy to. It's a lot like uh, many other schools at a glance, and it's you know it's a large brick building. You know, it looks like other schools. It's situated in a neighborhood that looks like you might expect given the socioeconomic status there. Um, but once you walk inside, you go through a metal detector and you feel a little bit nervous. And then when you get to the top, uh, the top floor where the school is located, it's it's so calm. It's amazing. It's clean. The students are are behaving. They have uniforms. Uh, it's very orderly, and uh, and then you notice the students aren't carrying books. They're carrying laptops. And you walk into a classroom, and the students are all seated at tables. They're working on laptops. Sometimes there's a teacher uh, at the front giving a lecture, but more often than not, uh, the students are working through a lesson online at their own pace. They check in with the teacher here and there to get some help. Uh, or if they're, if they're struggling, the teacher can approach them and help out. Uh, so so it's, a, it's a marked difference there when you walk into the classrooms. Uh, and that's, I think that's really one of the keys. <clears throat> that, that, that's a really good overview. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, who the school is actually serving? Um, who, who are these students that are, that are coming to it? Yeah, the vast majority of the students are from uh, from the surrounding neighborhood. It's Austin uh, in Chicago. It's I think it's about 10 miles west of downtown, but it's still in the city of Chicago, and it's a it's a it's a pretty poor neighborhood with a, with a with a high crime rate. Of, sorry, got a little echo there, but uh, very high crime rate and. and sorry, Mike, like, 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 Michael, go ahead and try. try. There you go. I think it's uh, the the audio on um, Michael's end. Okay. Um, anyway, it's a it's a neighborhood with a, one of the worst crime rates in the city, um, and these kids. Uh, there was a high school there historically that was underperforming, was shut down, and now, thanks to an initiative within the Chicago Public Schools, Renaissance 2010, several new schools have opened there to serve the community. Uh, so it's these kids that live within. Basically, a mile or two of the school uh, that are that are going to voice. You, you just mentioned something uh, there that, that that jumped out at me when I read the case and, and followed your work through it, which was uh, this program, Renaissance 2010. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about this program and and and, and what it did and, and how it allowed this school to come up uh, to serve these students that you just described? Sure. Yeah. It's. Uh, it's a program that started uh, several years ago in Chicago to open 100 new schools. Some were charter schools, some were contract schools, and some were performance schools. So different levels of autonomy and a little bit of different regulation. But the 100 new schools, by and large, had a great deal of flexibility to, uh, to try new models, which clearly this is an example. Um, so the program, I believe now, has actually finished. They've opened 100 new schools. And uh, three of them are there in the building. Uh, Voice is one of three in the building. And uh, so, so it includes different types of flexibility uh, where the, the funding is fairly unrestricted. So, so for example, Voice can do things like 
purchase laptops instead of uh, instead of buying full ranges of textbooks. Uh, they have flexibility on what kind of curriculum they have to teach. Um, really, they don't have a lot of interference from the Chicago public school system. There, once once the leadership of the school is in place, there's not a lot of of intervention, and uh, so it really allows them to. I don't really want to use the term experiment, but really it is about trying new models, and and it's also about making schools available to students like those in Austin, where historically the Chicago public schools may not have performed very well, and there's an appetite for for trying some new things. So let's talk a little bit then about how uh, so, so this program is in place to allow schools like the Boys Academy to be started or other innovative uh, or experimental uh, to use to use that word um, potentially uh, schools to get set up in Chicago. Can you, um, how did this process start? Who, who had the original idea for setting up the school? And, and what, did, what did it take to uh, become one of the 100 schools for Renaissance 2010? So there's a, there's a pretty specific process uh, that, uh, that has to be followed. And this, this whole idea came about um, from, from predominantly Dr. Sandra Atolls, who was at the time a CPS employee, but she had worked quite a bit with uh, distance learning models and uh, through the Illinois Virtual High School, had some experience with uh, with distance learning there. And uh, when she came to the Chicago Public Schools, she she noticed, <coughs> excuse me, she noticed a gap in the performance of uh, of students there through the Chicago Public Schools Virtual High School, uh, which serves the Chicago students. And through through all of her exposure to that particular school in Chicago. She started to do some research and and learn about how maybe the model could be modified to improve the outcomes for the students. And so, uh, yeah, through through that activity, she discovered a couple of key attributes that made the schools more successful. And a lot of it had to do with having well-trained mentors that the students could interact with in person, and having having classes even if they were online offered in school during the school day, having them offered for credit. So she discovered that several of these attributes of, a, of an online class helped the students be more successful and set out to create a school where she could put these uh, activities in action. And <clears throat> excuse me, through the, through the Renaissance 2010 program, there's actually a, an RFP process and you apply I think every year there's a there's an application process, and she designed along with a, a design team, designed a school and submitted for uh, approval, along with the approval of CPS through through the Office of New Schools. Uh, you also, if you're using a facility uh, that is owned by CPS, you have to get approval of the neighborhood uh, through a process called the Transition Advisory Council. Uh, so she labored through that process along with her team as well and, and had some ups and downs as described in the case uh, at least one neighborhood was not very receptive and uh, and they had to they had to move to Austin which it turned out was was a, a prime location to to put the model into action um, so so I think in total it was several years of work on her part designing and putting together the team and uh, and finally putting everything in place Uh, perfect. So uh, now, these were obviously community-rooted schools, and, and part of the, what was the reason that they were so? I was fascinated when you were writing in the case about uh, the reason to locate a, a community, a local school, not just bus these students out to wherever. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about that aspect of um, setting it up? And then you also have this term in the case called a TAC. <laughs> um, and uh, the Transition Advisory Council, and, and what role did they play um, in, in, in facilitating uh, the creation of boys as well? Sure. Um, so I don't know all of the intention behind the the neighborhood affiliation that that the Chicago Public Schools has in Renaissance 2010, but it's clear that they feel it's important for students to have local options, and 
partially you can see what happened when the Austin High School was closed uh, before Voice and the other schools moved into the building. The students in Austin had to be relocated to other schools, and and it's unfortunate they wound up in five schools that had horrible performance. Uh, and so, not only did they have to travel great distances to not great distances, but not trivial distances to get to these other schools that were in other neighborhoods several miles away. Uh, they were in schools that were underperforming not quite as badly, but nearly as badly as Austin High School. And, uh, and in many cases, it was really unsafe for the students to, to travel to those other schools. This is the kind of neighborhood where we have gang boundaries and a lot of activity outside that, that high school students shouldn't really be exposed to. And uh, you know, that made it very difficult for them to travel to these other schools. And I think that's the kind of problem that, that Renaissance 2010 is trying to address by stipulating that a large percentage of the students come from the neighborhood. And at Voice, I think that number is in the in the 90s. Uh, and I think it's required to be over 50, if not as high as 90 percent from the local neighborhood. <coughs> um, and the, the, the role of the TAC, I alluded to a little bit, the Transition Advisory Council. And uh, they, they come into play when there's a when there's a Chicago Public Schools building in the neighborhood where the school is applying to open. And it's, uh, I'm not entirely sure if there's a requirement for who serves on the TAC, but it tends to be community leaders, uh, maybe, maybe religious leaders. I believe there were several involved in Austin. And uh, it's a group of basically concerned community members that want to review the proposals for new schools uh, and want to understand you know, what the school is really bringing before they'll allow it to open. And this group, uh, each, each, each neighborhood has one of these transition advisory councils or tax. And the one in Austin had not been terribly receptive to new schools. They, they really just wanted the old Austin High School back, is my understanding. And uh, they, had, they had reviewed a couple of schools before Voice applied to open. And they had turned one down. They had delayed one for a significant period of time. Eventually, Chicago Public Schools uh, opened a school there against their wishes, just basically stating that there needed to be a school there. And uh, but but somehow, uh, Voice worked pretty hard to to convince the TAC that that they were bringing good things to Austin. And uh, ultimately, the way one of the participants phrased it to me is, uh, you know, this is this is cutting edge and why shouldn't Austin be a part of it? Why should these students not have access to this kind of technology and this kind of innovation? And, and I think ultimately that, that mentality uh, prevailed and, and the, the TAC approved for voice to open there and uh, there's, there's still pockets. My understanding is there's still pockets of, uh, of resistance, but by and large, you know, there continue to be students applying. They continue to be oversubscribed actually. So um, there's a healthy demand within the neighborhood and, uh, and a healthy approval of it. That's, that, that's really helpful. One of the things that you, you then jump into in the case um, quite, quite a lot is, is the boys' model actually in practice and what it looks like uh, in the actual classroom. And one of the things that I was uh, interested by was you spent a lot of time talking about this idea, this notion of culture, and you alluded to it uh, in, the, in the beginning of the uh, of, of our discussion. Um, but can you talk uh, a little bit about the creation of the culture and what they strive to do uh, with that um, uh, before getting into some of the online aspects that they deploy? Sure. Yeah. It's uh, you know I mentioned the the very calm and clean environment, and and that is one element of of the culture there, it's a it's a very the uh, the assistant principal, Dr. Ellison, described it as a culture of calm. And these are students who who live in a in a very rough environment, and they have to be tough. And you know they come to school and they feel like it's a secure place because of the the, the cleanliness and the order that they experience there. And and that gives them the freedom to to try and perform. And in conjunction with that. The faculty sets very high expectations. They they do not accept excuses. They believe that everyone can achieve, uh, and and that's evident in the in the decoration. For example, one thing uh, that I noted that there are college banners hanging around the school. 
implying that everyone there can go to college. And that there really, really is a perception that everyone can succeed. And so they set high expectations. They, they challenge the kids, but they're supportive. And the, the teachers really appear to be role models for the, for the students. Uh, they're fairly young teachers, um, and you know, they interact very personably with the students and support them uh, very regularly. They're committed. The, the teachers clearly spend a lot of time uh, thinking about school, at school, working with the students. And uh, so, so it creates this culture of performance that um, it's <coughs> excuse me uh, that that allows the students really to strive, but also to have the support to achieve. So what you just described to me uh, from the, from the outside sounds a lot like say a Kip school or uh, you know an Amistad Academy uh, school or something like that. Culture of high expectations. Everyone's going to college. Um, a lot of preparedness and so forth. Um, so that sounds. Uh, so I'm I'm just curious. Uh, you know what what's different about this school? Uh, what what makes it you know uh, different from the models I just cited? And are there similarities? Am I right in picking that up in what you're saying? I I definitely think that's right. I uh, so the offline elements do feel very much like a Kip school to me, with high expectations, uh, hard work. Uh, extra time. The, the school day is not explicitly longer, but there is more time available after school for for support and tutoring. The students come in on Saturdays, so you know clearly extended learning time is is a part. I don't know that the that the model is as explicit as something like a KIPP, but I, I agree with you. There are a lot of similarities, and the way I saw it is um, there, the the main part of the model here is about creating a high performance culture, and that is assisted by the elements of online learning. So the students, they have high expectations, but one thing that happens here, because of the online learning, they're able to take integrated assessments on a, on a daily basis in virtually every class. They can take quizzes. Even as they walk through the curriculum, it's giving them feedback on whether they've done a certain activity correctly. It may not ever get graded, but they get the feedback. And this, this gives them constant feedback feedback, it gives them an idea how they're progressing, and it gives them more, more rapid gratification. They can see that they can succeed if they keep trying. Um, if they aren't successful, it gives the teacher very rapid data on how they're doing. So every day the teachers know where every student stands, and they know which students were able to master the material in one try, and how many took three tries or more. And they can intervene either during class. They can they can call the student aside, and if it's a if it's a simple misunderstanding, they can solve it right there. They can provide support materials, or the student can stay after school that day. There's no waiting one week or two weeks to get a graded test back or or anything like that. It's it's a very rapid system, and that is more gratifying for the students, and it allows the teachers really to make more timely interventions. So it's it's speeding up that cycle of high expectations and high performance. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's also, the online learning also, one thing that, that you guys really hammered home in disrupting class clearly, it, it decouples the classroom. So like I was saying, if some students master the material in, in one try in 10 minutes and some students take longer, that's okay. Because the teacher is not at the front of the room leading class although that, that does happen. But in many cases, the teacher is sitting at the back uh, watching as the students progress and providing support to the students who need it and letting the students who can progress at their own pace move along as quickly as they'd like. So you, you just said actually a number of fascinating things packed into that answer. So try to tease apart a couple of them. And some people are, are, um, are, are picking up a few things. First, just a question to um, to, to answer one of the uh, one of the audience questions: uh, who, who provides the online learning courses specifically, or who created them? It's Apex Learning. Okay, so a Apex Learning provides the courseware. Now, uh, you, you you talked about the teacher's role. Uh, is, is sounds very different um, in this environment. It's much more 
supportive facilitator then? They're getting feedback and, and, and working with students. Do they do lesson planning and stuff like that? Or it's, it's uh, some sort of combination of the two? Yeah, it's a little bit of a combination and it, and it varies. Um, the different teachers actually do it different ways. They seem to have a lot of flexibility how they, how they actually work within this system. Uh, but they do still have lesson plans. Uh, and you know, there are still courses. You know, Algebra 1 is still a fixed amount of time. Um, but, uh, but the students can still move at a certain pace. And, and it also allows them, if they end up in Algebra 1 and they don't understand a concept from one or two grades previous, they can actually still remediate while they're in the class. So, so there's a great deal of flexibility that way. Um, so, so the lesson planning takes on a little bit of a different nature, but the teacher still has to know the, the progression of the, the topic. She, it's not necessarily fixed in time because the class could move at a different pace, but it's still, there is still a progression of topics just like in any other class. Gotcha. So this, this gets that actually an interesting strand um, that's you know, been debated a little bit in the literature. Um, uh, the extended learning time uh, you mentioned briefly uh, was referenced in, in Mass 2020 and, and uh, people like Chris Gabrielli have done some interesting work around uh, time and what it influences uh, for, for students' learning outcomes and so forth. One, uh, w one question I have um, is when, when I talked to them, they said, you know, this online learning, it sounds really neat with the flexibility, but our students really need rigidity. They need a hard schedule. It sounds like you're telling me that this is actually married both of those things. Am I, am I reading that right? Yeah, I think that's true. Uh, the students, it, you know, I could, I could assert this might be a group of students that wouldn't function very well if they were just sitting at home in pajamas in front of the computer, uh, but they have a daily schedule. Uh, the, the class schedule is not that different from, from any other class. The, the periods might be a bit longer, but it, uh, and, and there's the flexibility of, of coming after school and on Saturdays, uh, and that time is not necessarily as structured, but the, the traditional school day is definitely structured and, uh, and I think does give a fair amount of support combined with the other cultural elements that I, that I was mentioning that, that also provide some structure. The, the uniforms, for example, uh, the cleanliness, the, the low tolerance for, for disorderly behavior, um, all of these I think provide a certain amount of structure that I can't say it would be a requirement for everyone, but certainly seems to, to provide structure here. Gosh, and one other thing you mentioned was that students um, come in on Saturdays. Um, that jumps out at me on, on a number of levels. Is that a required component of it, or, or, or what, what, what's the deal with Saturday courses? Yeah, it's a, it's a requirement for some of the students, I think, when, they, when they're behind and, uh, and they have specific lessons. I think originally it started as a, as a punishment. Um, I, I think it was akin to detention to come in on Saturday. I believe that's, that's what they mentioned. And, you know, shockingly, people started showing up voluntarily. Uh, they didn't have detention. They just happened to like being at school around the role models that they had and, and in the, the calm and safe environment that the, the school administrators and teachers had created. Uh, in fact, they, <laughs> the principal, Mr. Yarch, was telling me many of the students showed up during the summer, too. Uh, and, you know, when the teachers were there trying to prepare their classrooms and, and, uh, and make arrangements for the school year, several of the students showed up as well to help and, and just, uh, just be part of, of building the school. That, that's fascinating. I know Catherine and I were talking before, and, and she, of course, talked before, and she was saying, you know, students staying after class, one thing, but coming in on a Saturday, Voluntarily is, is is quite another, and that, that that's pretty exceptional. Um, I, I'm I'm curious. Uh, the school is providing laptops for uh, every 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 student. Uh, what, what else are they providing um, for, for for each student? Well, they're they're providing the laptops uh, during the school day. They they lock those away at the end of the day uh, because you really just can't have kids walking around with laptops in this neighborhood. Um, but they've also purchased computers for the families to use at home. They're, uh, they're refurbished computers that are 
uh, probably not the newest computers, but that they they can get online where there's internet access. That has been a big issue is actually getting internet access to everyone. But they do provide the computers. Um, they they provide the curriculum too, which is probably obvious. Um, and and there actually are not textbooks. Um, there there's a set of textbooks in every classroom, but the students do not have the textbooks. And then there's there's supporting equipment and everything. I think they all get thumb drives to put to put their homework on, so they can carry the homework from the laptop at school to their uh, refurbished desktop at home. Gotcha. Now. Um, this is starting to sound a little pricey, um, so I'm curious, uh, what's the cost of the school, um, uh, and how is it funded? So this is uh, this is one thing that is great about Renaissance 2010. I think uh, is, and, and this is not unique to Renaissance 2010, but the the funding model there is is on a per pupil basis. So under a conventional funding model in the Chicago public schools. Uh, the school calculates how many teachers, uh, excuse me, the district calculates how many teachers the school should have and then just assigns the teachers. And they're paid for directly by Chicago Public Schools. And the school itself really doesn't get a lot of, of unrestricted funds. Uh, they, they get funds that are allocated for textbooks and equipment and so forth, but it's not a lot and certainly not enough that they can afford to purchase laptops or online curriculum. But under the per pupil model, they uh, they only get they get a certain amount of, of funds per student, and there's a actually a somewhat complicated calculation, but it's essentially a flat amount per student, and that money is unrestricted. CPS does not dictate how much of it has to go to teachers, how much of it goes to to textbooks, or actually none of it has to go to textbooks. How much of it has to go to other equipment? So it allows the school to to be creative with how it funds itself. And in this case, a couple of things. They they save money on textbooks because they don't have to purchase them. They really, like I said, just have a set for each classroom in case there's a in case there's a problem with getting online. Uh, or actually in case they want to punish a student. They uh, they take away his laptop and give him a textbook and the students the students consider that punishment. And um, and then they they have the fortune of having hired mostly uh, mostly newer teachers, and it's unclear how explicitly this was was decided for funding purposes. But the the teachers are all fairly young. I think that makes the group a little bit more receptive to the kind of technology and innovation that's going on here. But it also means that according to CPS pay schedules, they are less expensive than more experienced teachers. Uh, so it has disadvantages because under the quota funding model. You can have all PhD teachers, and it doesn't cost you anything. But uh, under this model, it means that you can have very good teachers who happen to be less expensive, and you can use that money to pay for online curriculum and laptops and refurbished desktops. Um, and there, there are other subtleties. Those, those are the things that stood out to me as as big differences that are enabled by the the funding model that Renaissance 2010 has. <coughs> And that's that's quite helpful, James. And it really are, uh, shows so that they were able to do build this environment uh, with this online learning that's uh, mastery based uh, for for this, basically the same funds as any other school, which which is pretty impressive to be able to provide laptops and desktop uh, computers. Now, uh, there's there's a bunch of questions coming in from the chat room uh, that that I'll just throw a few of them uh, to you. Uh, one one question uh, was: Is there time for students to work in teams on projects uh, throughout the learning day? There is, and um, I don't know if this happens every day, but it does. Uh, it does in select classes, and I know at least once a week there's a structured period for the for the students to work in teams, and they work. At least last year, they worked on a special project that was community related, and it, it had to do with Chicago's application uh, to host the Olympics. So they did a study on whether the whether this was a good idea for Chicago. Basically, was you know should Chicago host the Olympics? What would be the impact of that? And this was a a, a team based project that the students worked on. So they got to work together, and they they got to learn more about their community. And even even in the isolated, even in uh, let's say. Freshman Academy, or, or I, that 
English classes or something like that, the, the students who are moving at more or less the same pace do sometimes get grouped together to have discussions or to help each other through different issues. Um, and that actually then allows the teacher to spend more time with the students who are moving at a bit slower pace. Uh, so there, there are a couple of elements of, of teamwork there, some project oriented and some just in the course of the regular day. Um, that's helpful. One other question that we've gotten um, from a few people that I'm actually going to throw to Catherine because she's done some other research work on them is uh, to describe a little bit more uh, about Apex Learning. Uh, so, so Catherine, can you just give us a little bit more uh, background on them as a company? Yeah. So Apex Learning is the courseware that Employees Academy uses. And Apex Learning has been around for a long time. They began um, providing AP online courses. And eventually they've moved more towards credit recovery courses, um, dropout recovery, um, reading intervention courses. Um, right now Apex Learning is the number one um, provider of high school online courses. And they do, they have a very good reputation um, of being rigorous, of being mastery based, um, providing great input to teachers and students on how the students are doing. So, and actually just to give a little more context, if you read the Keeping Pace report uh, that uh, I NACOL uh, helped produce recently uh, with John Watson, uh, they have some numbers in there. And I think Apex Learning was over 700,000 enrollments uh, for the most recent year. So, so that may give a little bit more background on that. James, if I can turn back to you with another question that we had. Uh, people asked about extracurricular activities. Do students have an opportunity to participate in them? What with uh, you know, doing school after uh, school and so forth, uh, uh, what are the possibilities there? They do. I, I don't know um, a great level of detail, but I, I met with the, uh, the PE teacher and one of the, the coaches, and they, uh, they do have after school activities. In fact, they, they share some of them with the other schools in the building, uh, and they share coaches across the, the three schools that are there in the same building. So not only do they get to interact with other students in their school, but also with the students, other students mostly from the neighborhood that are in the other schools. Uh, and I, th I think it's really just like any other school in that regard. They, they stay after um, and, uh, and have football and baseball and, and this sort of thing. Great. Uh, another question that came up um, is around uh, special needs students and do, does the high school uh, except uh, uh, students with special needs or learning disabilities. How, how do they handle that? They do. I, I don't, I'm not sure if they can decide that or if they have to take them, but they, they certainly do. Uh, and they get, that's when I referred to the somewhat complicated per pupil calculation. That's what makes it complicated actually is they, they have some tweaks for the number of students with special learning needs because the district will provide extra funds for those students so that the school can hire special education teachers. So um, in many of the classes, there's actually the, the main teacher for that particular subject along with a special ed teacher who can provide more support. And you know, in reality, that teacher probably is helping a lot of the students, not just the specific special ed students, but uh, they do get uh, a, an additional allocation for for those students, and um, and yeah, they seem to serve those as well as everyone else. There's also, sorry, I just want to interrupt and say there's also time um, for the students to attend resource classes throughout the day that is built in, and the students um, that are doing well in their courses, they can take that time to check their email and, and relax. While the students need more help, um, they can meet with the special ed teachers and receive that support at the time. Great. Uh, another question uh, for, for both of you uh, was, was alluded earlier. Uh, James, what sort of um, state testing uh, do the st does the school get subjected to and what are the results so far uh, to the extent that it's known of, um, of, of students? Yeah, so um, they take, uh, looking through my notes, they take uh, each year, the ninth, tenth, and eleventh graders take a standardized test that's that's pretty typical. I think they're all mapped to the ACT. I'm not 100% certain. I know that in eleventh grade they take the ACT, and then I think there's there are two other tests that are similar that are in ninth and tenth grade. But those those results 
were not available yet at the writing of the case um, because the the I believe the class that took those in ninth grade they were just entering tenth grade and didn't have results yet. Uh, so unfortunately, those are not available. Yeah, and so the on track rate right now is the main metric used, but over time. Uh, one of the stipulations, James, as I understood it, of, of the Renaissance 2010 program, right, is that schools not meeting certain thresholds uh, actually get shut down much faster than do traditional district schools. Is that right? Exactly. Uh, um, CPS allows, I think, at least three years of operation before they will evaluate the school, predominantly because those results aren't available. And then they have a, a standard evaluation that takes into account the test scores at different grades and their trends across several years to the extent there are multiple years of data. It measures the, the freshman on track rate, which as you mentioned is now the primary indicator, uh, dropout rates and dropout rate trends, um, these types of metrics in addition to the standardized tests all get taken into account and reviewed and then CPS will make a decision whether that school's contract should be renewed or or dissolved, I guess. Gotcha. No, th that, that's helpful. And, and Catherine said it's about, it's a five-year period, I think. Um, what one, five-year period. Yeah, okay. So one uh, one other question that came in, which is a good one, um, is I, I, I think people are starting to get the feel that uh, people can progress at their own rates and so forth uh, because of the online learning. So it, uh, it allows for some variation there. Uh, but a question came in, do they still have bells that move them from class to class? Uh, how, how, how does that work? Well, they, they definitely still have fixed time periods where they move from class to class. I actually don't remember right now if they have an audible bell. I, I believe they do, but I, there's, <laughs> there is clearly a set time when classes change. Gotcha. So there's certain elements of the structure that are fixed, um, and then yeah, another thing that's interesting is not only do they have a bell schedule, but they go to the actual classes. So they go to one class and they study English. They go to another class they study social studies instead of being in one classroom together studying different subjects like some programs do. How how long is each class? Another question just came in. It's a block schedule, so each class is 90 minutes. Okay. And um, so during that time, all the students might be working on English, but they'd be working at their own pace. Um, wherever they are in the course at that point. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, uh, one of the other interesting things um, at, the, at the end of the uh, case, and, and James or Catherine chime in on this one, um, is uh, you talked about how it was used as a test site uh, for, for, I guess, disaster preparedness for the H1N1 flu. Uh, what went on with that? Can you, can you tell us uh, a, a little bit about that? Uh, uh, that experience for, for the school this year, I, I guess it was in September or October? October. Well, so the Department of Education um, became worried about the H1N1 epidemic that was breaking out and so they wanted to figure out what they could do in case there was an emergency and students couldn't go to school. If, if they were quarantined and had to stay home, how could they continue learning? And so um, they were intrigued by VOIS and thought it was a very interesting model and decided to experiment there to see um, how they could create a continuity, continue, how they could use computers for continuity of learning. And so on the day of the drill, um, the 10th graders actually stayed home. So the 9th graders went to school as normal and um, the teachers taught them online. So it was a virtual school that day. Um, all the teachers did different things to teach the students. Some of them had whiteboards, I mean had used Eliminate, some of them used whiteboard. Interactive, Interactive whiteboards, that's what I meant, sorry. Some of them had them email, um, record Spanish phrases and email it to them. And um, it was, it, the teachers hadn't done virtual teaching before. So they, to them it was a little difficult, but the students loved it. Um, they learned a lot from it and they really enjoyed it. And I think you said that there was a 93% uh, yeah. att attendance rate on that day. So it gave an idea for what would happen if school uh, had shut down uh, for some reason that learning mm -hmm. itself could actually continue. Another question came in that I, I, I don't know the answer to and I don't know if either of you will. Uh, I don't recall it in the case study which was uh, do the students do uh, community service? Um, James, do you know the answer to that by any chance or? Um, I, I, no, I don't know offhand, unfortunately. 
So if, if someone from Boise is on, maybe you can actually jump in and, and pipe in for that answer because I, I actually don't know the answer to that uh, question either. Um, now, I, I'm, I'm curious, James, as someone who was in the school, if, if you were to summarize sort of, uh, I, I know you were quite impressed with it on, on a number of levels. What's sort of the magic for you um, that happens there? What, 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 you, what jumped out at you um, as, as making this place somewhere worth, worth studying, if you will? That's a, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, it <coughs> excuse me, it's still young, but uh, and it, and it remains to be seen. But it really seems like, uh, you know, to be able to take a group of of, uh, of students, some of whom are at a third grade reading level, and and get them on track. Uh, it's a pretty fast development of of this kind of performance culture, and uh, I have to think it's because of that feedback cycle. And I, 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 that really hit me when I was watching it. That what's happening here is, you know, every day these students are are getting assessed, and it's not they're not getting assessed like they're taking the ACT or the SAT every day. They're, they're just taking little quizzes, and they know that these are low stakes uh, tests, and so they're taking them, and and they're really they're really getting good feedback. They're getting a lot of attention, and I think it's all just enhanced by that by that cycle. And um, you you really just don't see that very much. You certainly don't see it integrated in this way with the curriculum, and in the context of a, of a school that's trying to build this kind of culture. So. Uh, I, I, that really struck me as one of the keys to what's going on here. That's making that culture formation much faster and much stronger. No, that's fascinating. I think, and it, it really jumped out at me when I was reading the case and, and hearing you talk about it uh, as well. One, one of the other questions that just came in from the chat room is: uh, Since all the lessons are self-paced, uh, do you still offer advanced placement, or does Voice rather, because uh, it's not us? Uh, <laughs> Still offer advanced placement courses for the very high achieving students. They do. There's uh, there's actually, of course, they're in tenth grade now, and the, the vast majority of, of AP courses are are taken by eleventh and twelfth graders. But but there are several for for ninth and tenth graders, and right now they're offering AP U.S. History. I know, and there are a handful of students. They're actually sitting in the same classroom as the traditional U.S. History students. So. AP students in the same classroom with non-AP students, uh, and you know the AP students then are able to move at the faster pace required, and to cover the material dictated by uh, the AP course framework. And uh, unfortunately, there are no AP scores yet because they're you know they're still only halfway through the course. But uh, excuse me, but they made a decision to to put those two together, and it's all it's enabled by by the online learning and the ability to self-pace. Great. Uh, one more, one more question, and then I'll I'll open it up, um, uh, you know, to other people to take the open mic and ask questions. I think, uh, which is, so it sounds like this is going pretty well. Um, you've really identified some of the uh, interesting elements of it. One thing that just jumped out at me from your answer was that this, the online courseware, breaks the trade-off that we've used to have to make with uh, trying to keep people with their social peers. Versus their uh, perhaps uh, their learning ability peers, if you will, it breaks that trade-off. You you just had people in the same classroom just studying different things or going at different paces, uh, so it allows them to develop with their peers and, and nails that socialization need uh, or social need and uh, gives them different learning experiences appropriate for them. Uh, what about the replicability of, of the school? Are there plans to replicate it? What's what is CPS's policy on that? Are, are people trying to do it right now, or, or are they just sort of sitting back and watching to observe more? Um, yeah, let me let me ponder one small part of that question for a second, uh, which is, you know, right now th they still are largely in groups of of students their own age, and it's unclear yet whether this model would tolerate. Say a ninth grader and a twelfth grader both in Algebra One. Um, that isn't happening today. I don't know that there's anything stopping it from happening. It's just that the school's only a few years old, and uh, you know they still have it structured in that way. Um, but the potential is there, and and it remains to be seen 
how well that would that would work. Um, and then in terms of replication, uh, CPS actually is not excited about replicating the school until it's been there for several years. And I think that's really just, as we were talking about earlier, they can't assess everything when there's no standardized test data, there's limited data on the trends of, of dropouts or freshmen on track. Um, and, and they tried to replicate it. Um, Dr. Atoll's requested, I think through another RFP, I'm not entirely sure what the process is there, but, but clearly attempted to replicate the school and was not allowed to because it just hasn't been around long enough. And, um, you know, partially that could be skepticism, partially it's just lack of data. Great. Well, uh, Steve, if I can just turn it over to you maybe to describe the process for having someone jump on the uh, on the mic and asking uh, some questions. I know there's some that I haven't uh, haven't gotten to ask in, in the session, so if other people uh, want, want to jump on and, and ask a question, uh, now, now would be a great time for a few minutes. Absolutely. So if you'd like to ask a question using the microphone, look for the icon at the bottom of the participant window that has a hand and a green up arrow. And that's how you would raise your hand and we'll give you the microphone. If you do raise your hand and you take the microphone, to turn the mic on, you click on the uh, larger microphone icon down in the audio box. So please feel free to raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question through the mic, or you can continue to ask questions in the chat. It looks like Lynn has asked one uh, right off the bat, Michael. Sure thing. Uh, uh, what other states are uh, using this type of model is the question. Uh, I, I think I'll take a stab at that if, 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 if I will. Um, unless, James, you have any great examples right off the top. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take not, a stab not, at that. Not off the top of that. Okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, there are a number of uh, hybrid models coming into existence in different ways right now. Um, you've seen a lot of alternative schools that are targeting dropout students uh, that, that do stuff that is similar to this in certain respects. Uh, and, and so where students are actually learning in a physical environment, a lot of the credit recovery uh, has been hybrid in nature for a class by class basis. But there are relatively few uh, fully hybrid schools like VOIs currently out there. Uh, the Rocket Ship Academy has gotten some attention, uh, which is a, a charter school network really out of California, but it's younger grades right now. And, it, there's actually very few components that are actually online at the moment. So uh, relatively few places have a model that actually looks like this and has been as intentional, I think, about the culture formation as well as the online courseware uh, in concert together to sort of provide both uh, flexibility as well as rigidity uh, where, where that's needed. Uh, other questions that people have if they want to jump into it? There was an earlier question about uh, transcripts that I saw, so I'll, I'll jump into that. Well, anyone can raise their hand right away, but the question was, do seniors run into any issues, i.e. transcripts, weights of grade, et cetera, when applying to college in state or out of state? And obviously, to some extent, we wouldn't, um, we wouldn't know uh, the answer to that quite yet because there aren't seniors in this school yet. It's just ninth and 10th grade. Next year it will be 9th through 11th, and then the year after that it will be 9th through 12th, and then we'll have it full fleshed out. But it's a good question because there have been issues in other cases with students having online courses on their transcript applying to college or uh, potentially um, military academies and, and the like, uh, particularly with credit recovery in many instances. So. Uh, as well as getting credit for wet labs and so forth and advanced placement courses, and, and James may know more about that, that issue, but uh, that, that definitely is an ongoing question. My, my gut is it will be just fine here because it will be part of a traditional school, so to speak, with a teacher in person who is the facilitator of the learning, and that it will not be uh, as much of an issue on, in this particular case as my gut, but you never know. Uh, it's, it, it, is, it, is, it is hard to say. And, uh, that policy arena between higher education and high school is something that really still needs to be worked out. Uh, and, and sometimes we may walk away what's from, from what makes sense on one level to accommodate the other and so forth. But that's going to be an ongoing discussion. I just want to also highlight Michael Barber uh, mentioned a similar setup. 
Kiwe Tanak, is that, and Michael, tell me, I'm sure I mispronounced that, uh, Internet High School uh, in the Aboriginal flying communities in Northern Ontario uh, has a similar model as well. Um, I will ask a question here that um, uh, is, what are the biggest challenges that, <laughs> thanks Michael, uh, what are the biggest challenges teachers find uh, teaching with this model? I don't, I don't know, Catherine or James, if you have, James, if you have some perspective on that, the challenges teachers have teaching with this model. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember if I directly asked that. I, um, I don't think I did. I, I could certainly speculate um, a bit that, you know, you don't, you don't get taught how to teach like this in, a, in an education school. I, I'm sure Catherine can attest to how, you know, the, the education for teachers is, but I suspect it's just, it's so different from anything that, that is conventional. Um, it can be tough to adapt, and I'm not sure where these, student, uh, where these teachers did their student teaching, but as you just pointed out, there are not a lot of schools doing this, so it certainly was unlikely to be in a school with this kind of model. So, uh, so they have to be pretty adaptable and innovative on their own. And, uh, that, to me, that would be the biggest challenge, but I, I don't know that I, that I have that direct data from them. Yeah. Uh, Catherine, do you have a perspective on it? Yes, I haven't actually been to Boise to see it, but I've been to other schools where they have had a similar model where they've used APEX courses with teachers and talked to some of the teachers there. And I think um, the biggest, the hardest thing it is for teachers is is when they're first starting out is to give up the idea of teaching and let the computer do it and instead um, work one-on-one -on -one with the students and not have complete control of the curriculum. I think once they get over that hurdle, um, then they find that they actually are doing more teaching and that they're helping the students more. But I just think at first, from what I've heard of, from teachers, that seems to be kind of the challenge. That's quite helpful. Thank you. Uh, other questions, uh, if people want to jump in and and uh, participate or uh, throw them to the chat room. Michael, did you give a definitive answer on the course management system, whether it, it looked as though at one point it was Moodle and then weren't, weren't sure that was the answer? Uh, Catherine, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, so they use, they use School Town for their system. Okay, so that does all the course management, learning mm -hmm. management. Uh, does it also coordinate on the grades and notifying? Well, I, James, this would be a question for you too. What's the interaction with parents of these kids? Sometimes I imagine the, the, the family structures are are, are, uh, are are not as together as in other instances. So, yeah, I, I don't know the details about about transmission of grades and that sort of thing. I know that the school does try to involve the parents on a regular basis, and they, uh, you know, they. Uh, they have lines of communication to the parents and, and grandparents actually in a lot of cases these these students uh, are raised by their by their grandparents um, so I know there was discussion about conversations with parents about students misbehaving or or about students lying about their attendance or this sort of thing uh, I remember one anecdote about about that of a student getting caught in a lie about uh, about her attendance and and the parents care, you know, they just a lot of times uh, can't keep up with the kids and, and I think the school tries to help that and a lot of the parents are very involved through the through things like the TAC where, you know, they were they were very interested in what this school was bringing to the community and they were very concerned that their students would would really just be parked in front of a computer without supervision all day and they'd just be playing on the internet. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of the, the the parents have gotten over that and realized that there is supervision and this is an actual credible school. Um, but they've, you know, they've been involved because they're concerned about about their students' education, um, and they remain involved to some extent, daily or weekly. So we have about a minute left. Um, we're. Uh, we're just out of time. I guess, Steve, or should we try to? Uh, there was one other question that Lynn asked that I can quickly give a stab at it, or we can uh, jump, turn it over to you, and uh, just thank James and Catherine. Well, let's, well, thank, let's James thank James and Catherine, and Catherine but we can, we can still do your, do your final final question. Because I don't have anything else to say. Just to just thank, thank you for, for participating, participating today. today. All right. Well, then the uh, well, uh, the question then I guess I'll, I'll kick it uh, to Catherine is, uh, or, or James. How do the teachers feel about it? Um, so we talked a little bit about their struggles, but do they feel that 
this model is actually working for their students to achieve uh, success. Uh, James, do you have a perspective on that? Yeah, the ones I talked to were, were very excited about it. Um, you know, uh, particularly a few of them that helped design the school. Um, they really believe in this, and uh, and a lot of them, you know, they they one one of them uh, told me why she came to work at the school, and it was because uh, Mr. Yarch at a at a recruiting event basically said something very direct to her, like, "I believe every student can achieve. What do you think about that?" You know, and just it. She says that she came to work at the school because of of the attitude of of the students and uh, I mean the attitude of the administrators and the teachers and um, you know as I was saying earlier and you pointed out the culture is really a key part of it and, and the online learning is is in support but not the only feature of the school so uh, the ones I talked to are very supportive and they like it. Great, and, and Catherine has, has, uh, has, has perspective on it as well. Well, I just wanted to say many of the students when they came into the school were working, were reading and doing math below grade level and um, and if you look at where the students are now, most of them are on track in terms of their reading and their math and it's been amazing and I think one of the things that has worked so well for them is that they've had this self-paced um, curriculum where they can work at their own pace and they have to master at least 70 percent in order to move on to the next section. And so they aren't failing a course. They aren't falling behind. They might be taking it slower, but they're learning the material and they can't move on until they've learned it. Great. Well, I, listen, I appreciate it, uh, James and Catherine, for all the work you did here and, and thank you for joining us uh, on Steve's show, uh, the feature of education.com. And Steve, thank you again for the opportunity uh, to be on the show and to talk about uh, the case studies as, as they've emerged. And uh, thank you again for hosting. Just I'm looking at your February lineup. Uh, you just get great people on this show consistently, from James Paul Gee to Clay Shirky, uh, Daniel Pink, Tony Wagner, uh, Tim Magner, Sir Ken. It's just it's it's really great. So I, we appreciate this opportunity. Thank you again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, and just love what you're doing there in a site. Uh, and James, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate uh, hearing from you today. And Catherine, good job. Okay, so thanks everybody for coming. When you leave, you will notice that an evaluation form pulls up. Uh, your feedback is most appreciated. Do consider joining us later tonight for the PBS uh, Classroom 2.0 show. That's at 5 o'clock uh, Pacific time. You can see that at Classroom 2.0. Then tomorrow, Dan Coyle on the Talent Code. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, James. And thanks, everyone, for coming. Appreciate your being here.